I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. One important figure in Greek myth, who often pops up in the background of a lot of other myths, is King Minos, or Minos. In as early as Homer's Iliad, he is often referred to as a lord over many men in wide Crete. Later, the classical Greek historian Thucydides claimed Minos was the first man to build a navy, and used this fleet of ships to make himself master of the sea, clearing it of pirates and conquering various islands. All in all, he's a powerful king. Minos ruled according to the will of Zeus and listened to him when making laws. That's supposed to be a positive, making Minos a wise, just, and pious king, a favorite of Zeus, and a man who honors the gods. But maybe, perhaps just like the king of the universe, the king of Crete, was sometimes viewed as a tyrant. Some of his myths, such as the most famous one involving Theseus and the Minotaur, show him in that way. I won't go into the Theseus story here. I'll cover that in a later episode. This one will be on Minos specifically, on the myths surrounding his life and his family. I'll cover his birth and his sibling rivalry with his brothers, how he became king of Crete and offended the gods in the process, and then, in consequence, how the Minotaur, a terrible monster, came to be. Finally, at the end, I'll go into how Minos was both a great king and a terrible tyrant. For sources, I'm mostly using the Greek writer Apollodorus's work, the library, probably written in the 2nd century AD. It has a good selection of material on King Minos, but I'll also refer to Homer from the Archaic period, Diodorus from the Hellenistic, and the Romans Hyginus and Ovid along the way. All right, so let's go back to the beginning. Back in the Cadmus episode, I talked about how that hero originally went on a journey to find and rescue his sister Europa after she was kidnapped. Cadmus never found his sister, and ended up completing some other adventures instead, which I talked about in his episode. But it is now time to go back to Europa. To recap, she was a princess of a land called Phoenicia. This was a place located outside of Greece. In Greek myth, Phoenicia is a far-off land. It was also a real culture, located in what is now Lebanon and Syria. Even though Europa was from outside of Greece, she was not considered a foreigner by the ancient Greeks. According to legend, her family was descended from Io, and Io was originally from the Greek city of Argos and was an old lover of Zeus who was transformed into a cow. As you'll soon hear, this would only be the first time the family had a run-in with cattle. The princess Europa was very beautiful. So beautiful that she got the attention of Zeus, who decided one day to kidnap and seduce her. So Zeus turned himself into a white bull. Europa was picking flowers in a meadow with some nymphs and other girls when she saw the bull. She saw the magnificent animal, and she approached it to get a better look. Finding the bull to be tame, she climbed on top of its back. At that moment, the bull, Zeus, began to carry her away. Europa was unable to jump down, and so the bull carried her across the sea. Her family never saw her again. The bull brought Europa to the island of Crete. Once there, it transformed back into Zeus. The king of the universe slept with Europa, and they had children. According to Apollodorus, their sons were Minos, Radamanthes, and Sarpedon. Although, in the earlier Iliad, Sarpedon's mother was a different woman. At this point, as he tends to do, Zeus left his new lover Europa alone on Crete. Afterwards, The ruler of Crete at that time, Asterius, married Europa. He also decided to raise her three children as his own, because he didn't have any. When they were older, the three brothers argued and fought. There are two versions, and in both, they fight over the affection of a young man. In one version, this young man is Miletus, a son of Apollo. Miletus was more friendly towards Sarpedon, but Minos went to war against them, and they were pushed out of Crete. Exiled against their will, Miletus and Sarpedon went east to the coast of Anatolia, modern-day Turkey. While they both left Crete, their relationship was over, and they went their separate ways. Miletus went to the region of Caria, 
in southern Anatolia, and founded a city he called Miletus, after himself. This place was actually an important city in historical ancient Greece, and this story explains the founding of the city. Meanwhile, Sarpedon went to a different part of Anatolia, and ended up as an ally to a king named Silix, who, coincidentally, was one of his mother Europa's brothers. With Silix, Sarpedon fought a war against a kingdom called Lycia. He won the war, took over the country, and was granted a long life by Zeus. In the other story, Minos and his brothers fight over a different young man, named Atimimnius, this time a son of Zeus. Either way, the point of both of these stories is to explain how Minos, the stronger brother, was able to push his brothers out of Crete and set himself up as a king. Like Sarpedon, the brother Radamanthes also eventually left the island, but he went to Greece instead of going east. With his brothers out of the way, Minos stayed on as king of Crete after his adopted father, Asterius, died. His queen was a woman named Pasiphae. Pasiphae is interesting. She was the daughter of the god Helios and Perseus, one of the 3,000 Oshinid nymphs. Technically, this makes Pasiphae not a human, as she was the daughter of two immortals. She was the sister of the witch Circe, and Aetes, the king of a faraway land called Colchis. All three of them got some of the divine nature of their parents. The girls were both witches with magic powers. In later centuries, the Roman Hyginus said they had a fourth sibling, a brother named Perses. For now, let's talk about Pasiphae only, and leave her siblings for some later episodes. When she grew up, Pasiphae married Minos and had a whole tribe of children. As listed in Apollodorus's library, their sons were Catraeus, Deucalion, Glaucus, and Androgeus. Some of them share their names with some other famous heroes. Their daughters were Achille, Xenodyke, Ariadne, and Phaedra. Beyond this large family, though, Minos and Pasiphae had a really bizarre relationship, and there's a few reasons why. They were married, but like a lot of men in Greek myth, Minos had sexual relationships with other women. His wife, Pasiphae, knew this, and according to Apollodorus, she put a spell on Minos, so that whenever he slept with another woman, he would ejaculate a stream of wild animals into her. None of the women survived. This situation was eventually ended by a woman named Procris, who came to Crete after leaving her husband. In one version, she gave Minos a potion to cure him, so that she would be able to have sex with him safely. In another version, Minos is also infertile and unable to get Pasiphae pregnant. Procris comes up with a solution, where a goat bladder was inserted into a third woman, Minos had sex with this woman, first ejaculating all the animals into the bladder, and then afterwards had sex with his wife. Either way, in the end, Minos rewards Procris with a spear and a dog. The spear would never miss its target, and the dog would outrun anything it chased. Procris returned home and gave the spear and dog to her husband, after reuniting with him. Procris cured Minos' infertility, or just stopped him from accidentally killing his lovers, which, I guess, could also just be the cause of his infertility. The cure must have lasted, as Minos is listed as having several other children with other women besides Pasiphae. Apollodorus records one story about Minos' son, Glaucus. He says that when Glaucus was still a child, he tried chasing a mouse, and ended up falling into a large jar of honey, where he drowned. No one saw this happen, so Minos organized a search party for his son. An oracle determined a man named Polyidus would be successful in his search. Polyidus did find the body, but Minos declared that Polyidus must bring him back alive, and so Polyidus was locked up with Glaucus' dead body. Polyidus did not know what to do, but in his despair, he saw a snake and threw a rock at it, killing it. Another snake soon arrived, and after seeing its dead partner, it left and returned with a special herb in its teeth. The snake used the herb to bring the other snake back to life. After the snakes left and left the herb, Polyidus took the little plant and used it to bring Glaucus back to life too. The 
The most famous series of myths involving Minos began with Minos asking the god Poseidon for a bull. This event happened when King Asterius of Crete, the adopted father of Minos, died. Minos wanted to become king of Crete next, but his claim to the throne was opposed. To win over those that didn't want him, he needed to prove he had the support of the gods. Minos sacrificed to Poseidon and prayed for a particularly fine bull to appear to show the king had the gods' favor. Minos promised to sacrifice this bull. Out of the depths of the sea, Poseidon delivered a magnificent bull to Minos, one finer than any other he had ever seen. It was such an impressive creature, the king decided to not sacrifice it after all. Instead, he joined the bull with the rest of the cows in his herds, and sacrificed one of the others in its place. Poseidon was not pleased. If you're going to make a promise with a god, you better honor it. Poseidon was expecting the bull he sent to Minos, not one of the more common bulls from the king's own herds. Powerful king or not, Minos had double-crossed the great ruler of the sea, and for his insolence, Minos would suffer the consequences. First, Poseidon drove the bull wild. It went out of control, broke out from wherever Minos kept his herds of cattle, and began to rampage through the Cretan countryside. Next, Poseidon did one more thing. He made it so that Minos's queen, the witch Pasiphae, developed an intense lust for the bull. That, anyway, is according to Diodorus and Apollodorus. A third version, recorded by Hyginus, lays the blame for Pasiphae's infatuation with the bull on a different immortal. The Roman poet says that for several years Pasiphae skipped out on making offerings to the goddess Aphrodite. Naturally, that offended the goddess, and she inspired Pasiphae with the sexual attraction for the bull. Regardless of either version, the king and queen of Crete ran afoul of an Olympian. The dominant tradition seems to be that Poseidon was the one who punished them. What Pasiphae did next is referred to in several Greek sources, all more or less consistent. The oldest known one is the poet Bacchylides, writing in the 5th century BC. He says the queen went to Daedalus, a skilled carpenter and craftsman who was employed by King Minos after he murdered his nephew and fled from Athens, his home city. Pasiphae told Daedalus of her lust for the bull, and made him swear an oath that he would help her have sex with it. What follows is one of the more gross happenings of Greek mythology. Daedalus built a wooden cow, equipped with little wheels. To make it more real, he took the corpse of a real cow, skinned it, and then covered his wooden creation with the cow skin. This wooden cow was hollow, and Daedalus hid a naked Pasiphae inside of it. The inventor then towed the disguised Pasiphae out to a meadow where Minos's bull was known to graze during the day. The bull went up to the wooden cow and tried to have sex with it. The entire contraption allowed Pasiphae to position herself in such a way that hidden inside, she could allow the bull to have sex with her. So yeah, that's how the Queen of Crete took a bull as her lover. It's one strange story, and I'm sure it conjured up all sorts of weird imagery for listeners. A naked woman stuck inside a wooden cow, left in the middle of a meadow, with the sun beating down, must have been pretty uncomfortable. And then the added bull sex, all the result of a compulsion worked on Pasiphae by one of the Olympians. It's a disturbing scene, showing the gods' abilities to sink humans down to all sorts of depravity. From this affair between queen and bull, Pasiphae gave birth to a boy named Asterios. But this boy was not a human. He had the body of one, but he had the head of a bull. For his mixed appearance, Asterios was called the Minotaur, which means the bull of Minos, and he is probably the most famous hybrid creature in all of Greek mythology. King Minos, trying to figure out what to do with this monster child, consulted oracles. He had Daedalus construct a massive labyrinth, basically a glorified cage made of convoluted passages full of twists and turns designed to confuse any unfortunate soul who found themselves within it. The exit was undiscoverable, and Minos placed the Minotaur Asterios inside of this maze. After the Minotaur was hidden away, 
Hyginus says that Minos found out about the affair between Pasive and the bull, and what role Daedalus had in making it happen. Minos cast Daedalus into prison, but Pasiphae freed him from his chains and provided him with a boat to escape from Crete. In another version, Daedalus was not imprisoned right away, but grew afraid of Minos after the king put an enormous bounty on his head. To escape the island, Daedalus built a set of wings, cleverly designed and held together with wax. That story is best told by the Roman poet Ovid. Knowing that he would not be successful if he tried escaping by sea, because everyone was searching for him, Daedalus concluded that freedom could only be gained by passage through the sky. He turned his mind to arts unknown and nature unrevealed. He made wings from feathers and wax while his son, Icarus, watched. When the wings were ready, Daedalus took them and a pair for his son to fly. He told Icarus that when they were in the air, he should fly at a middle height, not to go too low or he'd be too close to the sea, or fly too high and have the sun scorch the feathers. But once flying, Icarus grew too excited to do what only birds could do, and he flew higher and higher. As he neared the sun, the heat began to melt the wax holding his wings together. Eventually, the wings fell apart, and he waved his naked arms instead of wings, with no more feathers to sustain his flight. As he fell, he yelled to his father before he hit the dark blue sea. Daedalus eventually found his son's corpse on an island shore, before continuing on alone to Sicily. Not happy that someone had escaped his punishments, Minos wanted to pursue Daedalus, but he didn't know where the wily inventor had gone. So Minos created a trap. He spread news in every country that he would offer a great reward to whoever could pass a thread through a spiral seashell. Daedalus, of course, was too smart for his own good. He couldn't resist the challenge. He solved it by tying the thread to an ant, and then coaxing the ant all the way through the shell, and out a hole Daedalus made in the end. When Minos had heard someone in Sicily had solved the riddle, he knew it must be clever old Daedalus. Minos went to Sicily and stayed at the palace of King Cocalus. Cocalus's daughters prepared a bath for Minos, and poured boiling water, or boiling pitch, all over the king. Some versions say Daedalus showed them what to do. Others say the daughters did it on their own, and there is no mention of Daedalus. Whatever the reason why Minos was there, the burns caused him to die a very painful death in Sicily, a gruesome end for the king. Several myths have Minos behave as a tyrant, and not a wise and just overlord. Some of these instances come out of Minos' attempts to grow his power across the Greek world, or to seek revenge for wrongdoings against him. One example concerns Minos and Pasiphae's son, Androgeus. He went to Athens and was murdered there. The circumstances of his death vary widely between different sources. Apollodorus records a couple. Sometimes he took part in an athletic tournament and was killed by jealous competitors. And sometimes he was killed after the king of Athens, a man named Aegeus, sent him to slay a large bull that was rampaging across the nearby plains. Either way, Minos was not happy over the death of his son, and he blamed Athens for it. He did what kings do best, declare war. In the fighting, Crete also had to battle against Athens' ally, the Greek city-state Megara. This kingdom was ruled by Nisus, who had a mysterious purple lock of hair in the middle of his head. An oracle had once foretold that Nisus would die when the lock of hair was pulled out, which you could also interpret as saying that he would only die if the hair was pulled out. Not a bad trick for a king fighting a war. Nisus had a daughter named Scylla, and she fell in love with our conquering king, Minos of Crete. The Athenian playwright Aeschylus, Apollodorus, and Ovid all tell how Minos used this love to his advantage. The king of Crete bribed the infatuated Scylla with a golden necklace if she brought him her father's purple lock of hair. She did so, and later presented it to Minos herself. Even though he had put her up to it, Minos was disgusted Scylla would betray her own father. In the end, he tied her to the stern of his ship and drowned her. With the hair gone, 
Nisus died, and Megara fell to Minos. The war with Aegeus of Athens continued. Aegeus was not killed, and Athens was never completely defeated. Minos prayed to Zeus to send a great famine to plague Athens. The Athenians consulted an oracle, which told them to strike a deal with the Cretan king. Minos ordered that every nine years, seven young men and seven young women, without weapons, must be sent to Crete. There they would be imprisoned in the labyrinth. Within those twisting passages, they would be hunted down and eaten by Minos's son, the Minotaur. Minos was not exactly a hero, was he? And this is actually fairly consistent behavior for Minos. He is often a tyrannical figure, whether in his early reign over Crete when he chased his brothers away, or in these later examples too. In fact, some Greek writers starting in the Hellenistic period, Diodorus being the best example, looked at the two depictions of Minos as a wise king ruling according to the will of Zeus versus a tyrannical conqueror and tried to rationalize these differences. Diodorus's suggestion was that there were, in fact, two King Minoses. The first Minos was the son of Europa. He was a wise and just ruler, and his son was Lycastus. The second Minos was the first Minos's grandson. According to Diodorus, this was the Minos who built a powerful navy and lorded over other kings with it. This was the Minos who was married to Pasiphae. Personally, I don't see the need for the distinction. I think it's a solution to a problem that doesn't actually exist. One man's king can always be another man's tyrant. Maybe Minos was good for the Cretans, but bad for everyone else. What this two Minoses thing does help with, though, is making a chronology of Greek myths. If you only have one Minos, the king must have been pretty old when the Minotaur story takes place. Of course, it is also a myth, and these stories are full of immortals and people who live for long periods of time. There's no real need to have two kings when one king would just be really old. Nevertheless, this two Minos theory may have a basis in history, too. And that has something to do with Minos's name. The word Minos is sometimes interpreted as an early Cretan word for king. It could be derived from Minu, a word that appears in fragments of the Linear A language used by the ancient Minoan civilization on Crete. That word could also be an individual's name, too. Maybe the stories of Minos go all the way back to some real or mythological king the early Cretans called Minu. Regardless of there being one Minos or two, the myths provide a role for King Minos after his death. The Olympian gods were very fond of Minos and considered him a wise mortal king. Fittingly, they made him a judge in the underworld. Homer says that Minos holds a golden scepter and sits in the underworld giving judgments to the dead spirits. He is actually one of a handful of judges. The Greek philosopher Plato says that Minos acted as a kind of judge overseer while two other judges, his brother, Radamanthes, and another man, split the judgments of those from Europe and Asia between them. In his description, Plato even makes a point of saying that Minos sits with a rod, just like how Homer said he sat with a golden staff. So that's the Cretan king Minos. He has a good side, where he's considered a just king who listens to Zeus and who ends up as a judge in the underworld. And then there's his more obvious bad side, where he fights against his brothers, double-crosses Poseidon, tricks Scylla into killing her father, and just generally pillages and plunders. Minos, like a lot of many Greek heroes, has a lot of deep character flaws, and these come out even more due to his extensive political power. And that's all for today. If you're enjoying this podcast, please send it to a friend who would enjoy it too. You can listen to the pod on several podcast streaming platforms, and I'm also slowly putting the back catalog of episodes on YouTube, audio only, but that is another option if you prefer it in the future. As always, thank you for listening.